Preparing for the NCCT NCMA certification test can be overwhelming. There is so much information out there and it can be challenging to figure out how do I even start. In this video, I'm going to go through really quickly why are we even getting certified? Why are we bothering? I'm going to break down the official test plan of the NCCT NCMA so that we know what topics we're going to face. We're going to go through actual practice questions and solve them so that we know what we're up against. I'm gonna go through the most common study mistakes that students make and how we can fix them if they do occur. And finally, I'm gonna teach you how to prepare for the NCCT and CMA the right way. So first, really quickly, why are we doing this in the first place? The reason why we're gonna get certified is that it is going to open up career opportunities for us in the medical field. We're gonna get better jobs and we're gonna get paid more money because we're certified. The test is mainly a multiple choice exam. There are going to be some alternative item types like drag and drop, so an example of drag and drop would be over here, where they're going to give us, say, for example, which of the following represents the correct order for performing a capillary puncture. And we're going to have to move these different steps into the correct order, drag and drop them, such that when we then go from top to bottom, we have the correct order listed. In select all that apply, they're going to give us a bunch of statements, and we're going to need to select which of the following apply out of all of the different options. So for example, they might have something like, which of the following are required when submitting a CMS 1500 form, which is an insurance document. And then finally, for select the hotspot on an image, they could have an image like this, which is my crew drawing of a person's chest and thorax. And they could ask you, for example, to indicate on the image where you would place the V1 electrode for an electrocardiogram, of which we would know here is the sternum, and V1 would be placed to the right of the sternum, at approximately the fourth intercostal space. And the test is going to be 150 scored questions. They're also going to give us 15 pretest questions, which don't contribute to our score. These are just new questions that the NCCT is testing. The test plan breaks down the NCCT NCMA into seven topics. We have pharmacology, clinical medical procedures, phlebotomy, diagnostic tests, general office procedures, medical office management, and law and ethics. And the NCCT does also provide an additional essential knowledge base, which is just an outline of topics that they feel you should know going into the exam. This essential knowledge base does overlap completely with the test plan topics. It's just written in a little bit of a different way. And you definitely should have gone through this prior to your test to make sure that these are all areas you feel comfortable with. And we're going to be given three hours to complete the test. And if you're preparing for the NCCT and CMA, you've got to check out SmarterMA.com. We have over 1,000 high-yield test questions with detailed explanations. Head to SmarterMA.com to get instant access to a free practice test. You'll get instant access without having to pay anything. Now, let's hop into a practice test and solve some questions. This is an example of an administrative question. Let's go through it. A patient pays higher monthly premiums to his insurance company in exchange for the flexibility to see providers both in and out of network without a referral. Which of the following types of insurance does he have? So what's the key information here? Higher monthly premiums and more flexibility to see in and out of network providers without a referral. This question stem is discussing a PPO and the key differences between an HMO and a PPO is that a PPO is gonna offer greater flexibility in choosing providers. You don't need a referral. You can go out of network, but it is going to cost more. Here's an example of an anatomy and physiology question. A medical assistant is performing an EKG tracing on a patient. Which of the following waves represents atrial depolarization? So we're trying to identify the different waves that are involved in an EKG associated with the atria contracting and depolarizing. So if you remember the order of an EKG, we have P first, then we have our Q, R, S, and then our T wave. And this is a simple schematic that I've created that represents what is going on in the EKG. The P wave represents atrial depolarization, and the entire QRS complex is going to represent ventricular depolarization. The P wave is when the atria contract, which is why A is our answer. And as a reminder, the atria are these top chambers of the heart, whereas the ventricles are these lower chambers of the heart. The atria receive blood and pump it into the ventricles, and the ventricles then expel the blood either into the lungs or into the body, also known as the systemic circulation. Here we have a question about the classic chain of infection. So the cyst is reviewing the chain of infection after the reservoir host, which of the following is next within the chain. So we need to remember our chain of infection in order to be able to solve this. And if we do, we'll be able to remember that after the reservoir host comes the portal of exit. 
So you do need to know all of these different stages. And it can be a little bit confusing to remember the different steps of the chain of infection, which is why I like trying to remember things via mnemonics. We try and include mnemonics wherever we can at SmarterMA. And so in this case, we use, I remember exiting today and train home, which is a little bit silly, but it will stick in your head. I remember exiting today and train home. And the I stands for infectious organism. Remember is reservoir. Exiting, which is why it's portal of exit, because there's two E's. Today is transmission. Entering, portal of entry. And home, host. I remember exiting today, entering home. So now we come back to our question. After the reservoir host, we're looking at what's coming next. Let's go back to our mnemonic. I remember exiting. R is reservoir. And exiting is exit. Our mnemonic is going to remind us that after R reservoir, we're going to have exiting, which is our portal of exit. This is a classic question about which of the following positions should you put a patient in for a certain type of examination. So a pelvic exam, the pelvic area, refers to the genitals. And for that, we're going to place the patients in the lithotomy position. In lithotomy, the patients lie on their back with their feet supported by the stirrups. And it's used for vaginal exams and pap smears, which is a test of the vaginal wall, as well as general pelvic exams and procedures. This is a clinical procedural type of question. Here's a communication style question where it's asking, how should the medical assistant act when speaking with an elderly? And this question requires good judgment, right? Because speak louder, you might think so, oh, it's an elderly person when you speak up, but it doesn't indicate anywhere in the question that the patient has any hearing loss. Trying to lead the conversation more would be assuming that the elderly patient has some sort of cognitive issue. And in fact, we always want to let patients lead the conversation and rather ask more open-ended questions. Determining if the patient has a companion that can be involved in the conversation is very assumptuous. And in fact, involving someone else in the conversation could violate privacy regulations. And so really, in this case, what we want to do is look for nonverbal cues that show a level of understanding. So this is things such as facial expressions and body language. And doing so will allow us to read between the lines and make sure that the elderly patient actually is understanding what we're telling them. And this is because the elderly patient might not speak up if they don't understand. And so looking for nonverbal cues, whether that's their brow is getting furrowed versus they're kind of nodding their head along, we're looking for signs of confusion versus comprehension. And here we have a medical law and ethics style question. So it's about a patient who is in acute care and they're making preparations in case of an emergency. And it's asking us which of the following represents an advanced directive. And when I hear advanced directive, I'm thinking advanced, so done ahead of time, and directive, which is like a direction. So an advanced directive, also known as a living will, these mean the same thing, documents a person's healthcare wishes in the event that they become unable to make decisions for themselves. So this could be due to illness or incapacitation. Picture a patient that recently has had a stroke and might need to go into a medically induced or natural coma. This patient is going to make an advanced directive. So lay out a document that contains their wishes. And if they become unable to make decisions, the document's going to lay out what they would like to do. So a power of attorney is an example of an advanced directive because it's a legal document that allows someone to act on someone else's behalf. So a power of attorney is a document assigning a surrogate decision maker, which is sometimes known as a healthcare proxy. So this is a person who is going to represent that patient if the patient becomes incapacitated. So for example, a patient might elect a spouse to become their surrogate decision maker through a power of attorney. Again, after this video, check out smartrma.com. You can get started 100% for free. Okay, now that we know what we're up against, let's talk about some of the most common mistakes that I see people make when they're studying and how to fix them. The first one is not starting early enough. So this test covers so much information there really is a ton that we're going to need to learn. And if we don't start early enough, we're going to put ourselves under unnecessary pressure and feel rushed. The second mistake is not using the right resources to study. So knowing what to study is just as important as how you study. And we definitely want to make sure that we're not using a resource that's outdated or inaccurate to the exam that we're studying for. Because we want to be saving time, not wasting it. And the final mistake that I see is people trying to do it alone. This is such a big test for you, and it's going to be very challenging and overwhelming, no matter what. But if you have support, you're going to be in way better shape. And so we'll avoid these problems by making sure that we start early enough. In general, I'd say most people need one to three months to prepare for their test. And I'd recommend that you do a bit of initial prep work before you schedule your exam, so you have an idea as to what you're up against. So whenever in doubt, it's always better to start preparing earlier than later so that you give yourself more time.
Next, we need to create a study schedule for ourselves. And that's gonna start off by setting aside a specific amount of time each day that we use to study. Creating a routine for ourselves when we plan to study and for how long every day. This is gonna hold us accountable and make sure that we're sticking to a plan. Of course, we definitely wanna make sure that we avoid burnout. This means taking breaks, going for a walk, doing things that we enjoy. Studying more than three to four hours in a day loses its effectiveness. And it's important to know yourself. Three to four hours might not be right for you. Maybe you can only study an hour and a half in a day. And depending on how long we study each day, that's gonna affect what our day-to-day -day study schedule is gonna look like. At smartermay.com slash guides, you can find our day-by-day -day study schedule for each of the different exams. Each of the study schedules lays out day-by-day -day exactly what you need to get done to make sure that you know that you're gonna have everything completed that you need to and be prepared for exam day. And then finally, we need to identify what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. So we all have things that we know really well and things that we struggle with more. And it's important to identify these differences so that we can be more focused and targeted in our practice. I genuinely believe that practice questions are the best way to prepare for the real test, especially when they do have good explanations. While I am biased, I do think that reading a textbook or just doing flashcards can be deceptive because it becomes easy to trick yourself into thinking that you know the material. I would strongly recommend studying with practice questions so you can actually determine for yourself what you do and don't know. And at SmarterMA, as you're answering practice questions, you can tag the questions at the bottom based on your understanding as whether you know it, sort of know it, and, or don't know it. As you tag questions, those questions are then stored. And if you head back to the classroom page, you'll be able to find all of your tagged questions in your tagged question section, where you're able to re-answer the questions and can now re-tag them based on your updated understanding. This way, we're always reviewing the material that we're struggling with the most, and we can focus on moving material from don't know to sort of know to know. Preparing for a medical assistant exam is going to be challenging, but with the right preparation tools and study habits, you can pass this test. With Smarter MA, you're gonna have everything you need in one place, we also have a 100% pass guarantee or your money back. And if you ever have any questions, you can feel free to send us a message. We have a team of tutors ready to help you. I genuinely want to help you succeed and pass this exam the first time. If you have any questions, reach out and check out smartermacom Pass your exam the first time, guaranteed.